Harvard Divinity School. The word dropped like a stone. Sacred Poetics under the Reign of the Money God. October 18th, 2021. My name is Shara Bloor. I am actually talking to you from nighttime Berlin. And I'm the Poetry Fellow at the Center for the Study of World Religions at the Harvard Divinity School. And I feel so fortunate to welcome you to today's um, event, a talk by Kaveh Akbar, a poet I admire deeply. And Kaveh was with us actually a fortnight ago for, um, he read at the launch of the new edition of Peripheries, um, which is a literary journal that is um, run by the center. And you can download it for free online. I'll add the link to the chat. But we were honored to publish poems from Carve's new book, Pilgrim Bell. And you'll find a poem called The Miracle, which Carve read at the launch. It tells the founding event of Islam. The angel Gabriel visits the prophet with the imperative to read or recite. So the founding miracle of that religion happens in and to language, with language. It's a linguistic phenomenon and its status as a miracle rests on its relationship, its proximity and difference from poetry. So it's an ambivalent relationship between prophetic and poetic speech. The one shouldn't be mistaken for the other. And yet, because this mistake is always possible, always a danger, it's the poet that can bear witness to the miracle. So when people doubted the revelation, poets were called in from around the Arabic speaking world. They were in a unique position to be able to recognize, okay, something very special just happened in speech, something unnatural, divine, perhaps something just. And perhaps the poet is also well positioned to recognize injustice. That is if injustice or idolatry or illusion is something that likewise can happen through and with and to language, something language can do. I believe that this is what Cave speaks to us about tonight. His talk is titled, The Word Dropped Like a Stone, Sacred Poetics Under the Reign of the Money God. And I welcome you to it. And to briefly introduce Cave, the celebrated poet, teaches at Purdue University and Randolph College and Warren Wilson. And he's the author of the chapbook, Portrait of the Alcoholic, and has two volumes of poetry, his debut, Calling a Wolf a Wolf, and Pilgrim Bell, which was just published by Grey Wolf. So let me hand this over to Kave. Thank you so much, Shara. Um, it's really, really lucky to get to be here. Um, I'm going to trust that um, there are more, more people here than just uh, than just Shara. Um, thanks to Nick, who was here and is sort of moving their hands behind the curtain to make all of this run. Um, uh, and thanks to Shara for that lovely introduction. Um, my name is Kav Akbar. Uh, I my pronouns are he him. I live um, on unceded Lenape territory in Indiana, um, central Indiana. I teach at Purdue University. I'm really, really excited to be here. I'm excited to talk about this stuff. I'm sort of just going to talk about some of the things that I've been wondering around and toward, wondering and wandering around and toward for the past, um, I don't know, year or so, maybe the past 18 months. I sort of put it into a cogent document um, that I might share it with people uh, who are smart and might help me wonder and wander around it. And that they that that seemed like this was a good opportunity for that. So um, I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to read it for um, I'm just going to sort of read the thing that I've prepared for um, the first chunk of this time together. Um, and then during the second chunk of this time, uh, we'll have an opportunity to sort of talk to each other. Although I guess maybe you guys will be invisible still. So I'm just going to have to trust that you're there um, and speak to the little yellow dot on my laptop. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but I'll know you from the language that you leave. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and we'll be able to talk to each other um, that way. 
Uh, so I'm going to get into it. Before I do, though, there is a little handout. You don't have to have this if you're like listening to this while you, you know, wash the dishes or wait to pick up your son from ballet or whatever. Um, uh, you don't have to have this handout. It's not imperative. I'm going to read everything that's on it just in the course of the thing, but just as like a sort of um, artifact of this conversation uh, so that you can kind of take it with you. Oh, crap. Um, so that you can kind of have it. Um, if you want to read along, if you're a person who likes to read along, um, if you have any sort of um, auditory impairment that makes it difficult to follow along, if you have whatever, whatever, um, or if, if you just want to have access to the poems that I'm talking about um, later after this conversation, or if you're like, God, I couldn't stand that Kava guy, but those poems that he was talking about sure sounded interesting. Um, there's a document. Hopefully that link works. Uh, if someone can confirm in the chat, maybe that it opens for a non me person and that there's no permissions issues or anything. Um, I think you are all able to access the chat, um, just like a thumbs up or something. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, okay. So that's all you need. Um, I'm going to get into it. Uh, and here we go. Okay. Um, brilliant. Uh, okay. In 1989, I was born in the middle of a snowstorm in Tehran. My first two languages were Farsi and English, in that order. My first full sentence was, gimme ab. Ab being the Farsi word for water. I've always been a bit thirsty. I've always been a bit enamored of the materiality of language trying to snap together parts that don't exactly click, but might if coaxed just right, like sticking a mega block into a Lego. My third language was Arabic, but Arabic gets an asterisk because I never really spoke it. I just learned to pray in it. When we came to America, Islam's five daily prayers became one long prayer to say at the end of the day. We were full of these kinds of new world workarounds. My mother never ate pork except secretly in the form of pepperoni pizza. Once every evening, my father would announce it was time for namaz, uh, evening prayer. And he, my mother, my older brother, and I would assemble to do our vuzu, a kind of pre-prayer ablution. Uh, drawing water to wash our faces, our hair, our heads, our arms, our feet. Then we'd gather as a family in the kitchen or living room or a bedroom to lay out our mats and move through the postures of devotion. In my very early childhood, I would just watch my family, mimicking their movements as best as I could. Mostly, their prayers were whispered, barely audible, so instead of sounding like them, I focused entirely on moving like them, cupping my hands before my face as if they were full of water, then splashing my hands up to my ears, bending at the waist, kneeling, touching my head to my janamas, my own tiny embroidered prayer mat. <clears throat> However, when I was six or seven, my father decided it was time to teach me to say the prayers on my own. He wrote out the Arabic words using the English alphabet spelled phonetically in various colorful inks. He laminated the pages and every day he and I would spend an hour together sitting on the couch, studying the plastic pages. The line would say Bismillah Rahman Rahim and slowly we would make the sounds together. Me leaning up towards his stubbly lips, blissing in the magical music that came from them. We'd practice saying it all together, moving through the postures right there on the old couch, us both laughing at my forgetfulness, growing tired and eventually hungry. It didn't take long before I had mastered it, could offer 15 minutes of continuous prayer in this gorgeous, mysterious language. I was so proud and so was my father. It was the same language spoken by the prophet himself. The poet Kazim Ali writes, if prayers can make a place holy, then it must mean there's some divine energy that moves through a human body. 
I learned from Kazim that the Arabic word ruh means both breath and spirit. It's also true of the Latin spirare. Um, and this seems absolutely essential to my understanding of prayer, a way of directing, bridling the breath spirit through a kind of focused music. This music, this way of hymning directly to God was my first conscious experience of mellifluous charged language. And it's the bedrock upon which my understanding of poetry has been built. I had no dictionary sense of what the words actually meant. Arabic was a private tongue reserved for God, God's own tongue. And I understood if I spoke it to God earnestly, mellifluously, it would thin the membrane between us. Poets have invested themselves in this promise for millennia. The idea that mellifluous, earnest language might thin the partition between our world and the next, our world and the divine. That there might, in our breath, exist a bit of spirit that could be harnessed, bridled. It's an idea as old as language, as old as incantation. The earliest attributable author in all of human literature is an ancient Sumerian priestess named Enhedwana. The daughter of King Sargon, Enhedwana wrote sensual, desperate hymns to the goddess Ainana. Written around 2300 BCE, Enhedwana's poems were the bedrock upon which much of ancient poetics was built. And her obsession, the precipitating subject of all of our species' written word, Ainana, an ecstatic and often desperate awe at the divine. Here's an excerpt from one of her hymns to Ainana, translated by Jane Hirschfield. And this is again on that handout, which you don't have to look at as I read it, but if you want to, it is on that handout. Um, a lot of her translations, if you look up her translations, a lot of them are sort of done from the Sumerian cuneiform um, by anthropologists. And so, you know, they're, they're really focused on getting the meaning right, um, but there's just no ear to it, right? So it's like, bird, woman, fly, magic wall, you know, and um, just really starchy and unreadable and, you know, not the way that you translate anything else, but, um, but Jane Hirschfield has worked with those anthropological translations with the trot, you know, the raw literal translations and brought it into something like a contemporary lyric. And, um, and so that's what I'm reading from is this poet Jane Hirschfield's translation. Lady of all powers in whom light appears, radiant one, beloved of heaven and earth, tiara crowned priestess of the highest God, my lady, you are the guardian of all greatness. Your hand holds the seven powers. You lift the powers of being. You have hung them over your fingers. You have gathered the many powers. You have clasped them now like necklaces onto your breast. Like a dragon, you poisoned the land. When you roared at the earth in your thunder, nothing green could live. A flood fell from the mountain. You, Ainana, foremost in heaven and earth. Lady riding a beast, you rained fire on the heads of men taking your power from the highest, following the commands of the highest, lady of all, all the great rights, who can understand all that is yours? In the forefront of the battle, all is struck down by you. Oh, winged lady, like a bird, you scavenge the land, like a charging storm, you charge, um, like a roaring storm, you roar, you thunder and thunder, snort and rampaging winds. Your feet are continually restless, carrying your harp of sighs. You breathe out the music of mourning. It was in your service that I first entered the holy temple. I and Hedwana, the highest priestess, I carried the ritual basket. I chanted your praise. Now I have been cast out to the place of lepers. Day comes and the brightness is hidden around me. 
Shadows cover the light, drape it in sandstorm. My beautiful mouth knows only confusion. Even my sex is dust. And that's just an excerpt. I'm gonna paste that um, link to the handout in the chat in case anyone uh, came a little late. I could spend our whole time together just marveling at this artifact with you. And Hedwana has been one of my most treasured companions through the quarantine. A woman who lived roughly 43 centuries ago, writing about the same things I've spent my life wondering about, wandering toward. What language can and cannot do. Doubt, exile, bewilderment. There is in the vast shadow of a global death event, of numerous worldwide fascistic takeovers, of total irreversible ecological collapse, a sense of the utter unprecedentedness of our moment. It's easy to feel rudderless, like there is no path forward that includes the survival of our humanity. But then reading a poet like Anne Hedwana who wrote her verse roughly 43 centuries before this date, I feel more than anything else, utterly precedented. She writes, like a dragon you poise in the land. When you roared at the earth, in your thunder, nothing green could live. She was writing to Inanna, the ancient Sumerian goddess of love and fertility and war. But she may as well have been writing to the American God too, the money God, whose reign of destruction has also poisoned the land and ensured nothing green could live. Fracking and Monsanto and microbeads are all 21st century faces on a species old problem, mankind's corrosive impact on the earth. She writes in the poem of exile saying, I carried the ritual basket, I chanted your praise. Now I have been cast out to the place of lepers. Day comes and the brightness is hidden all around me. It is unclear when or why Enhedwana was exiled, only that after her father's death, her brother took over the kingdom of Ur and she was for a time banished. The great moral tests of the 21st century will be refugee crises, which will only grow more dire over time as the effects of climate change continue to displace populations. Thus far, we as a species have failed these tests miserably. Brexit, children in cages. What can an ancient Sumerian poet teach us about immigration reform? Track the rage in Enhedwana's final moments. And the brightness is hidden all around me. Shadows cover the light, drape it in sandstorms. My beautiful mouth knows only confusion. Even my sex is dust. I find myself unaccountably moved by this language. For one, it is clearly the language of a poet throwing her hands up, saying, I don't know what language can or can't do, but I am desperate and I need someone to hear this. It's the promise I found inside language as a boy praying with my family in Arabic. Here I am speaking earnestly, mellifluously, believing such speech can be an end to itself. But I am also drawn to Enhedwana's rage. Today, more than anything else, it's rage that seems to govern me. I am an Iranian mostly raised in America, caught between two national regimes actively toxic to hope. To quote Audre Lorde, it is not my anger that launches rockets, spends over $60,000 a second on missiles and other agents of war and death, pushes opera singers off rooftops, slaughters children in cities, stockpiles nerve gas and chemical bombs. Hope comes and goes in a world that actively conspires against it. But occasions for anger bloom in both my nations daily. State murder of civilians, voter suppression, murderous foreign policies. In such a world, an engine that runs on rage will never sputter. And ultimately, I do think rage is a measure of tenderness. Rage is our ability to imagine wholly the humanity of the harmed. 
and then Hidwana trains us in that imagining. Really believe that, you know, that rage can come from a surfeit of tenderness. Um, if you can imagine fully or fully enough the interiority of a harmed party, it stands to reason that you would feel rage. And I think that one of the important things that movements like BLM have taught Americans in recent years is that from the vantage point of mortal terror, fear for yourself or for your family or for your kids, rage looks pretty comfortable. Um, rage, rage, outrage, um, repulsion, these things look pretty comfortable from the perspective of mortal terror. And I think that that makes it incumbent upon those of us with access to rage to leverage that gulf between our rage and other people's mortal terror into something like action. Anyways, <clears throat> that I'm in recovery is no secret. My whole first book or largely orbits my getting clean. A year after I got sober, I learned from a routine physical that my liver was behaving abnormally, teetering on the precipice of pre-cirrhosis. This was after a year of excruciating recovery, a year in which nothing harder than ibuprofen passed through my body. If it's this bad after a year of healing, a nurse told me, imagine how, must, how bad it must have been a year ago when you quit. When I got sober, it wasn't because I punched a cop or drove my car into a Wendy's or anything dramatic like that. I had a dozen potential bottoms that would have awakened any reasonable person to the severity of my problem, but I was not a reasonable person. The day I finally lurched my way towards help was a day like any other. I woke up alone on my floor, still drunk from the night before. I remember taking a pull from a nearly empty bottle of Old Crow by my mattress, then searching for my glasses and car keys. Finding them, I calmly drove myself to help. The Greek poet Sappho, born roughly 630 BCE, was by all accounts one of history's greatest poets, but the entire corpus of her work burned with the great library of Alexandria. So today we only know her through the bits other writers have quoted. We know that in fragment 22, she wrote, because I prayed this word, I want. But we don't have the entirety of the poem preceding it. Her because hanging there to explain some now unimaginable consequence of desire. I am understandably, I think, obsessed with desire and its consequences. If my liver function was still so erratic after a year of healing, then at the end of my act of addiction, I must have been near some sort of Rubicon from which there could be no return. Some awareness permeated my dense fog of destruction. That awareness might have been bodily, the way an iron deficiency sometimes provokes in a person an unconscious desire to eat dirt. It might have been fatigue, a cumulative sense that the corrosive manner of my living had become untenable, or it might've been something else. I'll never know, which I think is the point. A common formulation states that prayer is a way of speaking to the divine and meditation is a way of listening for it. Poetry synthesizes these, the silence of active composition being a time even the most skeptical writers describe using the language of the metaphysical saying such and such a phrase just came to me or those hours just flew by. And then reading a process through which dark runes on a page or strange vocalizations in the air can provoke us to laugh, to weep, to call our mothers or donate to Greenpeace or shiver with awe. It is wrong to think of God as a debt to luck, but I could have died and then I didn't, I haven't when so many around me, like me, did and have. The grief of survivor's guilt is real. The omnipresent grief of still being here and not knowing what to make of it. 
Most of us are probably familiar with the Kubler-Ross model of grief, named for Swiss psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who wrote about it in her 1969 book on death and dying based on her work with terminally ill patients. The model states that dying people, or those who love dying people, will often pass through five main terminals of grief, denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. Most of us have some familiarity with this way of thinking. But again, the model is utterly precedented. Here's a poem from the indigenous Mesoamerican Nahuatl people orbiting a mother's death and childbirth, first recorded in the 16th century, but likely quite a bit older. Um, I'll post that uh, handout here again in the chat in case there are new people. Um, again, on your handout, it says that this is that this poem is from 1574. Um, it's like I said, it's likely much older than that, but this is the first recorded instance that we have of it, um, the first translation into, into Spanish from the Nahuatl. Um, uh, again, this is a Mesoamerican sort of oral poem. Um, uh, and um, uh, from the perspective of a midwife addressing a mother who has passed away in childbirth. Okay, so I'm going to read it. You can follow along if you like. Also, I don't speak Spanish, um, and there are some words here that I'm going to pronounce. I apologize in advance um, for those of you who are Spanish speakers. Precious feather, child, eagle woman, dear one, dove, daring daughter, you have labored, you have toiled, your task is finished. You came to the aid of your mother, the noble lady, Kihokwaro Quilatsli. You received, raised up, and held the shield, the little buckler that she laid in your hands. She, your mother, the noble lady, Kihokwaro Quilatsli. Now wake, rise, stand up. Comes the daylight, the daybreak. Dawn's house has risen crimson. It comes up standing, the crimson swifts, the crimson swallows sing, and all the crimson swans are calling. Get up and stand up, dress yourself, go. Go seek the good place, the perfect place, the home of your mother, your father, the sun, the place of happiness, joy, delight, rejoicing, go. Go follow your mother, your father, the son. May his elder sisters bring you to him. They, the exalted, the celestial women who always and forever know happiness, joy, delight, and rejoicing in the company and in the presence of our mother, our father, the son, who make him happy with their shouting. My child, Darling daughter, lady, you spent yourself. You labored manfully. You made yourself a victor, a warrior for our Lord, though not without consuming all your strength. You sacrificed yourself. Yet you earned a compensation, a reward, a good, perfect, precious death. By no means did you die in vain. And are you truly dead? You have made a sacrifice. Yet how else could you have become worthy of what you now deserve? You will live forever. You will be happy. You will rejoice in the company and in the presence of our holy ones, the exalted women. Farewell, my daughter, my child. Go be with them. Join them. Let them hold you and take you in. May you join them as they cheer him and shout to him, our mother, our father, the son, and may you always be with them whenever they go and they're rejoicing. But my little child, my daughter, my lady, you went away and left us. You deserted us and we are but old men and women. You have cast aside your mother and father. Was this your wish? No, you were summoned, you were called, yet without you, how can we survive? How painful will it be 
this hard old age? Down what alleys or in what doorways will we perish? Dear lady, do not forget us. Remember the hardships that we see, that we suffer here on earth. The heat of the sun presses against us. Also the wind, icy and cold. This flesh, this clay of ours is starved and trembling. And we, poor prisoners of our stomachs, there is nothing we can do. Remember us, my precious daughter. O oh, eagle woman, O oh, lady, you lie beyond in happiness in the good place, the perfect place. You live in the company and in the presence of our Lord. You live. You as living flesh can see him. You as living flesh can call to him. Pray to him for us. Call to him for us. This is the end. We leave the rest to you. a little uh the poem really gets me this ancient poem of indigenous mesoamerica preceded the kubler ross model by at least 500 years but you can map kubler ross's five stages of grief almost directly onto the poem remember those five stages are denial anger depression bargaining acceptance so denial wake rise stand up anger you went away and left us, you deserted us, and we are but old men and old women. You have cast aside your mother and father. Depression. Yet without you, how can we survive? How painful will it be, this hard old age? Down what alleys or in what doorways will we perish? Bargaining. You as living flesh can see him. You as living flesh can call to him. Pray to him for us, call to him for us. Acceptance, this is the end. We leave the rest to you. It's astonishing. What can ancient spiritual poetry teach us about our living? A living that so often feels governed by grief. A half millennium before Kubler-Ross studied this phenomenon clinically, the Nahuatl people were already teaching it. Um, and, and also keep in mind that the idea of art as an aesthetic object, you know, like, a, like as a painting that you hang on the wall to appreciate aesthetically is like a relatively new and a relatively Western. I don't like the word Western because the earth is a sphere and it places the center in Europe, but um, it's a relatively, it's a relatively new thought, the idea of art existing as ornament, as an aesthetic thing, right? This was a poem, but it was a poem used to teach people how to move through grief, right? It was a poem um, that was passed as an oral tradition, but it was a poem that in the same way that we have the Kubler-Ross method, uh, and, you know, that sort of clinically helps us sort of study psychology and um, help people move through these terminals of grief, right? Um, that's what this poem was doing. That's exactly what this poem was doing, um, you know, 500 plus years before Kubler-Ross studied it clinically, right? <clears throat> It's also, oh, it's also important to note here that American spiritual poetry didn't begin with Dickinson or Whitman or anyone else writing in English, not even Wheatley or Jupiter Hammond, but with the Mesoamerican and Native American people who inhabited the land that would later be called America, passing their sacred texts along for centuries. Relative to how long those texts were a part of the Earth's spiritual history, Anglo-American writers like Dickinson and Whitman are relatively brand new. To flatten the project of spiritual poetry to a bunch of white romantic and metaphysical poets is to erase the Ethiopian epic Kebra Nagast, to wash away Lipo and Rapia and Mahadevyaka and Teresa of Avia and Basho and Gilgamesh. It's a colonization, one that erases not only the bodies and lands, but actual spirits. One of the questions you can ask a poem to what do I owe my being here? Li Po says, I sing and moon rocks back and forth. I dance and shadow tumbles into pieces. Ana Ahmadova, the world dropped like a stone on my still living breast. 
my working definition of sacred poetry rises directly out of my experience as a child praying in Arabic. Earnest musical language meant to thin the partition between a person and a divine, whether that divine is God or the universe or desire or land or family or justice or community or sex or, or, or. As with my early prayers in Arabic, a one-to-one -one denotative understanding of the language isn't important. What matters is the making of music and the sincerity of the making. When I was getting sober, I found no easy prayers, no poems to sing me well. What I did find was that during the early days of my recovery, when sobriety was minute to minute, white knuckles and endless cheap coffee by the pot, poetry was a place I could put myself. I could read a book of poems and for an hour, two hours, I didn't have to worry about accidentally killing myself. I could write a poem and the language for what was happening would just come to me. Hours would just fly by. Rapia al Basri, writing in 717 CE. Kings have locked their doors and each lover is alone with his love. Here, I am alone with you. My active addiction was a time of absolute certainty, certainty of my own victimhood, of my convictions, of what I was owed by a universe that had split me from the land of my birth and dropped me into an America that was actively hostile to my presence. That certainty destroyed whatever it touched corroding my own life and the lives of people who loved me. In recovery, when I threw myself into poetry, I was drawn to poems that were certain of nothing, poems that embraced mystery instead of trying to resolve it. W.B. Yeats, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. <clears throat> And it's not just writers from antiquity who take up this challenge of unknowing. Even today, when irony remains the default posture of the public intellectual, poets remain relentlessly sincere in their explorations of spirit and faith, of the mysteries that make and shape us. Here's Lucille Clifton. And this is on your handouts as well. my dream about the second coming. Mary is an old woman without shoes. She doesn't believe it. Not when her belly starts to bubble and leave a print of a finger where no man touches. Not when the snow in her hair melts away. Not when the strangers she used to wait for appears dressed in lights at her kitchen table. She is an old woman and doesn't believe it. When something drops onto her toes one night, she calls it a fox, but she feeds it. The capitalization in the third to last line is Clifton's preserved. Um, the word, for those of you who aren't looking at the handout, the third to last line is when something drops onto her toes one night, she calls it a fox, but she feeds it. And the only capitalized word in that in those three lines uh, is the word something. When something drops onto her toes one night, she calls it a fox, but she feeds it. Um, the capitalization in the third to last line is Clifton's preserved. It's Clifton's poem within the poem. Something, a proper noun despite its own mystery. When I talk about engagement with spiritual poetics being an exercise in sitting in mystery without trying to resolve it, this is what I mean. A capital S something drops onto your toes one night and you don't know how or why, but you feed it. <clears throat> Clifton has an entire suite of fox poems orbiting this mysterious something fox, delving into its mystery without ever really diminishing it. Clifton teaches me to wander into mystery without galloping towards some hasty and inorganic conclusion, which in turn informs my living. I'm trying to persuade you of the contemporary utility of writing that orbits what G.K. Chesterton called a vertigo of the infinite. Uh, G.K. Chesterton actually used that phrase um, 
as a sort of pejorative, like making fun of the sort of writer, you know, he was like, oh, they're all, uh, you know, they're all dizzy from their vertigo of the infinite. But I actually thought that was like a really great, you know, he was like using it to make fun of people like me who think kind of like this, but I actually really like it. I think it's a great phrase. Um, <laughs> so I'm sort of using it out of context or I've like, I've claimed it. Um, uh, it's not exactly out of context, but it's like, anyways, um, I'm trying to persuade you of the contemporary utility of writing that orbits what G.K. Chesterton called a vertigo of the infinite, what Clifton called the lip of our understanding. Inquiries into the divine still connect contemporary poets to their ancestors. In one poem, 12th century Kannada poet Saint Mahadevyaka writes, when the body becomes your mirror, how can it serve? When the mind becomes your mind, what is left to remember? In her astonishment written over, in her poem called Astonishment, written over 800 years later, 20th century Polish Nobel laureate Wisława Szymborska seems almost to pick up where the ancient Kannada poet left off, wrapping question after question around the immobilizing strangeness of being anything. Why, after all, this one and not the rest? Why this specific self, not in a nest, but a house, sewn up not in scales, but in skin, not topped off by a leaf, but a face? The great Persian poet Hafez wrote, start seeing everything as God, but keep it a secret. I still have no idea what I mean when I say God, but I see it everywhere. I meet it intensely. I write poems and yes, books about it. I read about it constantly, which seems counterintuitively to only deepen its secret. Uh, I can't see you guys, but I actually want you all to do this for a second. Um, I just have to take your word that you're doing it. Uh, close your eyes. Um, imagine and really do this, do this. Close your eyes. Imagine in your head a bladeless knife with no handle. A bladeless knife with no handle. Do you see how the image recedes from view the more language I add to it? A bladeless knife with no handle. Today, the great, you can open your eyes. Today, the great weapon used to stifle critical thinking is a raw overwhelm of meaningless language at every turn. On our phones, on our TVs, in our periphery, on billboards and subways. So often, the language is passionately absolute. Immigrants are evil. Climate change is a hoax. And this new Rolex will make you sexually irresistible. Poetry opposes these things, asks us to slow down our metabolization of language, to become aware of it entering us. Sacred poetry teaches us to be comfortable with complexity, to be skeptical of unqualified certitude, in reminding us that language has history, density, integrity, such poetry is a potent antidote against a late capitalist empire that would use empty, vapid language to cudgel us into inaction. The bladeless knife with no handle. I can't think of a more useful skill to arm yourself with in the year 2021 than the ability to sit in mystery without trying to resolve it. Carolyn Forche writes about poets who, and this is a quote, don't easily extricate morality, ethics, the sacred, and the political. For them, it's not possible to think of these as isolated categories, but rather as modes of human contemplation and action which are inextricably bound to one another. I'm gonna read that again really quickly because I think it's important. Um, Carolyn Forche writes about poets who don't easily extricate morality, ethics, the sacred, and the political. For them, it's not possible to think of these as isolated categories, but rather as modes of human contemplation and action which are inextricably bound to one another. Um, that, again, that was Carolyn Forche. An attuned permeability to wonder compels the curious poet to rigorously examine their stations, both cosmic and civic. So many of my friends, my students have articulated some version of one particular anxiety, anxiety to me over the past year. Perhaps you in the audience have experienced it too. The anxiety is, 
How can my writing, my work matter right now? How can anything I have to say be timely or worthwhile? To them, I continually point toward Anhedwana, whose four millennia old poetry feels utterly, miraculously prescient to me in my living today. I point to the Mesoamericans who taught us how to move through grief centuries before the advent of psychiatry and psychotherapy became serious medical disciplines. I point to Clifton, Shimborska, to Rapia and Mahadevyaka and all the other poets discussed here. Writing Snapchat or Miley Cyrus into a poem doesn't make it timely. Writing in humanity in all its endless mysterious baffle does. I want to end with a poem by the 18th century Japanese poet Kobayashi Isa, as translated by Robert Haas. And this is also on your handouts if you want to follow. The poem in its entirety reads, the man pulling radishes pointed my way with a radish. The first time I read this poem, it felt like a trick like a silly one-off. The great masters wrote those too. Something about it stuck with me though. Something about its repetition. Heidegger wrote, language itself is language and nothing else besides. The understanding schooled in logic that calls this proposition an empty tautology. Merely to say the identical twice, language is language. How is that supposed to get us anywhere? But we do not want to get anywhere. We would like only for once to get to just where we already are. To get to just where we already are. I'm gonna read that poem again. The man pulling radishes pointed my way with a radish. The man pulling radishes is strapped to his living like anyone else. What does a man pulling radishes have to point the way? Well, the radish. We are inheritors of a murderous age. As writers, we've deputized ourselves wardens of our species' most dangerous technology, the English language, a language invented by men, a language deployed throughout history in service of colonization, genocide, ecological decimation, chattel slavery, the building and deployment of nuclear weapons, drone warfare, and more. That's our paint. That's our radish. What are we to do then? We who are tethered to language like a plant to the soil. We who ride into a country run by religious zealots to their one true God, the late capitalist money God, to whom they would sacrifice our lives, the lives of people we love and people who love the way that we love. What are we to do amidst such zealotry? Well, our ancestors have given us models. Reject certainty, which exists only in the rhetoric of zealots and tyrants. Reject false equivalencies, the vapid argle-bargle of empire. Adjust our metabolization of language to remind us of its materiality, its power. Our task as wardens of our species' most dangerous technology to treat our materials seriously Embrace the mystery of earnest, mellifluous language. Embrace its infinite potential to thin the partition between us and the world we seek. Um, so that's what I've prepared um, uh, in a way of in, in a way of sort of summarizing my thinking around some of this stuff, um, and uh, and maybe introducing the conversation to those of you who are here in attendance, provided that there are um, some of you here in attendance. Um, so we have about a half hour, I think, um, for a Q and A um, where we can sort of talk to each other. So happy to field, hey Shira, um, I'm happy to field um, questions, comments, concerns, complaints, Joys, raptures, sorrows, epiphanies, ecstasies, nightmares, visions, whatever, whatever you have to share. Um, 
I'd love to, I'd love to chat about this stuff. This is sort of all I think about anymore. And so I'd love to chat with smart people about it. And you seem like smart people. This is very beautiful. Thank you so much, Kave. I have, I have to um, speak for everyone. Unfortunately, um, we can't see the audience faces. There is a large audience listening. Um, and we can give you a moment to um, write questions in the Q&A. I was gonna start with the question that I've just read that Isabel, who is um, a dear friend of ours has written a beautiful question. I wanna start with that. Um, so I'm gonna read it. It's um, really interesting. Okay, so she says, how do grief and interdependence interact with one another in poetry? If art bridges a gulf between the dead, the living and the unborn, how does the time scale of the present, a president's tenure, a national history, bear on our sense of radical inter interdependence? Does poetry resist this? And that it always addresses the unborn. It's like a dissertation in a question. So, yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah, the idea of poetry always addressing the unborn is, mm. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, th there are two. You know, people throw around the idea. Thank you so much. You said that was from someone named Isabel. Isabel. Thank you so much. Well, that's that's right. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I think that people talk a lot about such and such a poem is timely or such and such a poem is the poem that we need right now or whatever. Um, and I think that oftentimes what that what they are really saying is that such and such a poem is disposable, right? Such and such a poem is like sort of, you know, one use, you know, like you write a poem about, you know, the Walmart that opens in your town or whatever and it's like just about the Walmart that opens in your town so I like the idea of um I like the idea of thinking about serious poetry um sort of orienting itself towards the unborn or towards the future I also think about and I don't know if this is exactly answering your question but I also think about in the spectrum of different mediums relationship to time um, you know, if you, if you like, you know, this, I have these broadsides behind me, right? And any one of them, like pretend that's a painting, right? This is a little, I don't know how to move my laptop like this. Uh, pretend that's like a painting, right? Um, the entirety of the painting enters the, it, this is the entirety of the painting enters the eye at once, right? The entirety of any of these paintings enters the eye at once. So, um, the temporal, I mean, and certainly you could like, move your eye and study like a certain detail and you know move your eye around the painting but unless it's like a vast sort of mural that takes up you know multiple rooms or multiple floors or whatever you know um uh that sort of two-dimensional art tends to all enter the eye at once and so like the the temporality of the poem is quite instantaneous or the temporality of the art is quite instantaneous rather um for sculpture it's a little bit different right because like you know, this, this sculpture of this sparkling water that I have here, right? Like if this is in a museum and this is a sculpture that someone has made, you know, like an Ottoman vase or something, um, you can, you can perceive a facet of it in a moment, like a painting, right? But it's not until you animate your body and move around it in its entirety that you can take in the entirety of the text, right? Um, the entirety of this sculpture is not, can't be revealed to you without incorporating the body, which means incorporating time, right? And so the temporal loadout of this sculpture, of this Ottoman vase that I'm showing um, is different, right, than a painting, right? I always, I always thought that, and then on the far end of the spectrum is something like music, right? Um, you can't say anything about, um, you know, Rachmaninoff by listening to a single note, right? Like you have to listen to the entire composition. Right. Um, you can't say anything about a film and its duration uh, or its plot, really, by looking at a single frame. Right. You have to see the entirety of the thing. Right. Um, and so those exist on this far end of this temporal spectrum where you have to like perceive the entirety of the thing to get any sense of its scale. Right. 
Um, I always thought of poetry as existing um, somewhere near sculpture in that, right? Because like for a sighted reader, if you look at that um, Issa poem uh, that I shared, right? It will immediately enter the eye and you'll say, okay, this is like, you know, 10, 15 words, right? Like this is gonna be, be you know, this is gonna be a very quick engagement, right? Versus if I hand you the Bhagavad Gita, right? That sits very differently in the hand right? The, the, your, your sense of temporal engagement is dramatically different, right? Um, but I also want to add to this that um, I taught, uh, you know, a, a former student, current friend of mine is the poet John Lee Clark, who is a deafblind poet whose first book is coming out with Norton this next year, and everyone should read it, but it's called How to Communicate. But um, he's deaf and blind. And in teaching him, you know, I realized that this relationship is um, completely, you um, is completely contingent upon sightedness, right? Because for him, like the like that Issa poem, his braille reader is two lines at a time, right? And so that Issa poem is exactly the same length at a glance to him, at a glance to him as the Bhagavad Gita or Gilgamesh or whatever, you know, um, you know. And so, like, I don't know, like the even even the even the scale of a piece of art's temporal engagement. Um, is so contingent upon our specific bodies and our specific sort of like corporeal loadouts, right? And I think all the time about Yates talking about being this like beautiful immortal soul fastened to a dying animal, you know, it's his language fastened to a dying animal. And um, I just think about like all of the limitations that my body imposes upon my ability to perceive the texts that the world gives me um, and like how unaware I am of all of those limitations. You know what I mean? Like how um you know um how i will you know and that's the project of like defamiliarization in art etc cetera, etc cetera. but like um yeah i don't know i'm i'm sort of i i feel like i've spun totally free from the actual question now but hopefully something in there hit at something that you were asking as well um I think by starting with Isabel's question, I might have worried the audience in thinking that they have to ask something <laughs> complex because uh, yeah. you don't. Uh, so please ask anything. And while we wait for you, I'm, I'm gonna ask something. I hope I don't do something complicated as well now, but- um, I mean, this I is complicated. And, yeah, if there were easy <laughs> sort of monolithic certain answers, it wouldn't be interesting to talk about. You know, right. I just write a paper and be done with it. I think um, I have a question that is maybe like just a question that's always bothered me. It's something mm -hmm. about the like true and the beautiful and the good. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Kaveh. But um, there was something you were saying at the end there that reminded me of um, Chris Deva has her PhD thesis. Um, this argument that I've always liked. And she argues that like poetry shows you how language works to produce meaning and its tools mm -hmm. are like, just like everyday languages, images, rhythm, voice, but we don't see them at work in everyday language. So poetry is doing this deconstructive work for us. And so it's really similar to what Marxism does in like showing um, the means of production of products and we don't see like how things are being produced. So I've always really liked this and it sounded like mm -hmm. you were saying well language has uh, poetry and language has all these functions that maybe if we turn poetry just into like an object of aesthetic appreciation, you said this right, then it we kind of like lose that work that it's doing for us. And there's mm -hmm. all these functions that are very important for justice, for the good, um, mm -hmm. that poetry can do, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so this is what I took you to be saying at the end, but there's always this question I have, this like worry that it's like, if poetry is this kind of acti activity, are its ends like definitely good? Are we sure? Um, is unknowing always good? Like it, it worries me whenever there seems to be like a guarantor of goodness, you know? Mm -hmm. like, oh, totally, yeah. yeah be a good yeah. poet and you'll be a good person. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I know poets, yeah. you know? I, and that, yeah. yeah. 
Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, like, you know, you're you're resisting certainty. You know, I mean, like, yeah. I, I hope that what you got from this wasn't like, here's a blueprint on how to be a good person. You know what I mean? Like, no, <laughs> like here's. A, um, yeah. But I but I do think that like, you know, you you use the word. There are a lot of things that I want to say in response to what you said. You know, you you were talking about like um, this very sort of Wittgensteinian idea of like words mm -hmm. are how you right. use them or the meaning of the word is how you use it, right? right. Um, but also like, um, shit, there were so many things that I wanted to say in response to what you said. Um, the, uh, the idea that, oh, right, right, right. Um, and so the idea that like all of this work can only be deployed towards noble ends, right? Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, of course it's like, um, you know, we're using this word work and that, that was another thing when you said you were talking about like the good work that poetry can do and work by the physics definition of work is the force applied to an object in order to move it, right? The force applied mm -hmm. to an object in order to move it, right? And so by that physics definition, um, it's not work if you apply force to an object but cause nothing to move, right? Um, and it's not work if you merely comment on the movement of an object without having applied any force to it, right? And I think that those are two hallmarks of weak poetry, too. You know, uh, um, uh, you know what I mean? Like, I think that I think that inhabiting the carapace of revolutionary rhetoric without actually advancing anything new um, is is a week it is the hallmark for sort of like a hollow poetics right as is um you know commenting on um something that you had no part in you know the the poet Gwendolyn Brooks had um has a book of poems called Annie Allen that won the Pulitzer Prize in 1949 and um there's a sequence of poems in that book called the children of the poor and one of the first it's like the second or third um poem in that sequence is called first fight then fiddle um, and, and I feel like those four words just like more accurately synopsize, like, like everything that I just said and like this stack of whatever, <laughs> like could just live in those four words, you know what I mean? Which is to say like, um, you do the work, you first fight then fiddle, you know, like you do the work of clearing out space for, um, you and your community, whatever your community may be is, art to exist in the world and then you sort of like make the art right but you don't confuse one set of actions for the other right you don't you don't confuse which i you know not for nothing is like the bedrock upon which my understanding of prayer is built to you know not to get too sort of woo woo about it but like my conception of prayer isn't that it's just like an incantation to summon an interventionist God to do my bidding, right? Like if I just like say these words in the right order, then like, you know, superhero God comes in and like gives me a winning lottery ticket or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, um, I, I don't pray for the unhoused and then be like, oh, great, did my, did my work today. You know what I mean? Like you pray for the unhoused and then you go buy socks and cliff bars and distribute them, right? Like that's how prayer works, right? It points you towards the next action, right? And, and this is my conception of poetry too, right? Is that it doesn't supplant the action, but it points you towards the action. Does this make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. Or this is my, this is my conception of successful poetry, I should say, um, uh, because I don't want to say like, again, like all poetry is doing this or all poetry is good because it does you know what i mean like but my yeah. conception of like successful poetics for myself is poetry that points me towards the action and and that is like small and fond and local you know what i mean like it's it's like you know call my niece and talk mm -hmm. to her for an hour. Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like it's never like stand in front of the tank that's coming down the street because if i wait for that to happen you know i'm gonna i'm gonna wait a long time without doing any good you know yeah yeah i have a lot I want to say, but I have to ask other people's questions. Sure, 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 um, sure, sure. Yeah. I'm going to do that. Um, okay, so this is Kate, and uh, she says, I really appreciate what you said about the poetry that filled America and our world long before Dickinson and Whitman. How do you conceptualize that work, the way those voices are still ringing out? 
How do we hear and count those voices that are not being read currently or barely being read, but which may have been deeply important for hundreds of thousands of years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Kate, for that question. Um, I'm, or I have edited an anthology of spiritual poetics for Penguin called, um, I think it's now called 100, uh, the Penguin Book of Spiritual Poetry, 110 Poets on the Divine or something like that, that will be out. Um, at some point in the next year or so, but um, so much of the project, you know, if you were to accurately account for the human project of spiritual writing, as I'm sure that everyone in attendance here knows, you know, it, you wouldn't be talking in, a, in terms of page count, you'd be talking in terms of like how many libraries, right? Um, you know, to, to, to accurately represent that project, right? And so to to try to do something like that and 110 poets was ridiculous, but it's also true that so many of the anthologies of spiritual poetries that preceded um, this project uh, that I took on um, were like, you know, if there were 25 poets in it, it would be like 23 British romantics and metaphysical poets and then like maybe Rumi and Sappho for, you know, a little spice, you know what I mean? But, um, <laughs> you know, and and that's just that's just not, I mean, again, like the history of human, of attributable human writing is about 43 centuries old. And um, and it has existed in every continent, you know, whether it's, you know, I mean, like a lot of the sort of African texts or Mesoamerican texts that exist in the, um, that exist in the anthology were oral um, texts that were passed on. A lot of the uh, Aboriginal Antipodian texts that exist in the anth anthology were um, oral texts that were eventually transcribed. But but there's no there's no culture that doesn't have stories, you know, um, and um, and so you know the the work was not passive. You know, to answer your question just directly, it's not passive. You know, like the if 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 you're just sort of like waiting for those writers to be accounted for in the Norton, right? It's not going to happen, you know? Um, and so you kind of have to actively seek them out. And another thing that I took on in this project was, you know, even when you find those texts, so many of them were done by like, you know, so many of the translations from, for instance, the Nahuatl um, or um, from the, you know, the old Anglo-Saxon charms or whatever you're looking for, right? Um, were, uh, were done by, you know, old white men, you know, from a hundred years ago, you know, and those are the only translations that we have of these. So one of the things that I was able to do with this project was commission new translations of some of these texts from um, women translators, from black and POC and indigenous translators, from trans and queer translators, you know, and so, um, so it's not just like the curatorial, curatorial aesthetic shaping text selection, but it's also like um, bringing the actual translations into, um, you know, the, like, it's like the difference between the Jane Hirschfield translation and the sort of like starchy anthropological translations of Enhidwana, right? Um, like actually allowing the poems to sing to us in a way that is sort of like, in, in a way that doesn't completely kill the spirit of the thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, to, to answer your question very simply, it's not it's not passive, right? The American literary appetite is wildly provincial. Um, you know, American American readers don't even read like Canadian or British writing. You know what I mean? Like we don't even read like other English writers, let alone like writing in other that was originally composed in other languages. You know what I mean? And so um, it's just it's just not passive. Like you have to you have to do a little bit of legwork. Um, okay, so choosing questions here. Um, I'm going to ask you this one. Uh, Jason asks. Could you say something about whether or how you feel connected to the numinous when you're working on your poetry and also whether you take any specific steps to enter that space? Numinous as in, I guess, the feeling of divine mystery maybe? Yeah, divine. sure, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, and this is from uh, Jason? Jason. Great, thank you, Jason. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think that most writers talk about getting to a place where 
um, again, I, I sort of touched on this, but you know, we talk about like hours flying by or such and such a phrase just came to me, right? This is the language of the su supernatural, right? Like, and and again, the most like sort of boots on the ground, um, skeptical writers talk this way, right? And I'm not the most skeptical anything, right? But, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of writers talk about courting that um, experience of writing that is not merely of the intelligence that is not merely of the ego you know um you know whether you want to call whatever that other thing is your subconscious or um the muse or um whatever it is that is like not merely um your intellect refracted onto the page right um i think that uh i think that that's of course huge for me and i think that for me it's always the language that leads me there you know i, I think that there was something in the question about like how do i court that space or something um and for me it's always a, a poetry is a deeply spiritual technology for me right um uh the two spiritual technologies that i have in this world are my body and my language and both of those are hugely imperfect and hugely you know have huge huge um uh imperfections that make it really difficult to wield them but i do think that language can get me a little bit closer towards the kind of clarity that I seek in a in a horizontal way, you know, like the horizon, like the horizon, you're always marching towards it, and you never actually get there. You know, I think that this is, I think that this is sort of um, a horizontal thing like that, right, the way that like, like standing on my roof gets me a little bit closer to grabbing the moon than standing on my floor, you know what I mean, like, it gets me like that much closer to the clarity that I'm after. There are a lot of good questions. I'm struggling to <laughs> work. No, you're good. You're good. There are, yeah. Um, These are beautiful. I'm just trying to keep up. I hope any of this is cogent. It totally. Um, there's just so much here. Um, okay, so let me let me. Okay, because I think this follows off from the last question, and it's something I was also interested in when we're talking about different technologies and the kind of technology of not knowing. So Liz mm -hmm. Hannah asks, um, she says, I'm not sure how to ask this, but I find myself curious about the listening, receiving aspect of experiencing poetry, this not knowing maybe. Um, a phrase ecstatic listening occurred to me. And I'm, a curi I'm curious about not just how our state of consciousness or being alters our receptivity or what we can receive from a text, but maybe our willingness to be formed by what we are taking in some aspect of sacred poetry lying in a sacred listening or attending and perhaps a sacred relationality um, would be grateful for any perspective. So I think is sort of asking for more elaboration on that, not knowing us. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. This was, you said this was Liz? Liz, uh, Liz yeah. Liz, thanks Liz. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, what you're getting at is so much the project of art making, you know, not to not to generalize too much, but I, uh, the Russian literary critic Viktor Shklovsky wrote a paper um, called Art as Technique, in which he introduces the idea of defamiliarization. And the famous line from it is make this, you know, the artist must make the stone stony, right, to make the stone stony, which is to say, like, we see tens of thousands of stones every day, right? Um, if you walk anywhere to anywhere, you'll see you know, a thousand stones, right? But how many of those stones could you actually describe with any acuity, right? I run around my neighborhood, you know, you can see my outdoors right there. There are all these trees, you know, and I run around it every day. Um, and despite the fact that intellectually, I know that every one of those trees is taking light from a star that lives 93 million miles away and turning that light from a star that lives 93 million miles away into glucose, which weighs something, you know, like light, that light weighs nothing, you know, and the glucose that land that arrives, uh, that uh, arrives isn't the right word, but the glucose that is formed from that light weighs something, right? Like you can put it on a scale, right? From light, from a star, 93 million miles away, right? And that's where like all that, tree, all those trees come from that, you know what I mean? And despite the fact that intellectually, I know this, 
I couldn't, if you gave me like a pen and some paper right now, I couldn't draw a single one of those trees that I run by every single day, right? I couldn't draw a single one of them with any sort of like, I mean, I, you know, I could be like, okay, yeah, you know, like there's the sycamore over there and da, 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 you know, but uh, I couldn't draw like that tree with, a, you know, I draw like the idea of a sycamore or the idea of a, you know, the idea of a crab apple, right? Um, I wouldn't be drawing like the specific tree, you know, despite the fact that intellectually I'm aware that they're this literal miracle, you know, like I understand that it's photosynthesis and, you know, I've read the Wikipedia page for them, but, you know, like, uh, so I'm practically an expert, but uh, so, um, but like naming magic doesn't make it not magic. You know what I mean? Like it's light from a star 93 million miles away that becomes a tree. Right. And, um, and I can't, I don't see them, you know, when I, when I see them, I see the idea of a tree, right. I don't see the trees. That's the damage of habituation. Right. And that's what, that's what defamiliarization does. Right. When you say like, make the stone stony, make the tree tree. -y, um, that's what Shklovsky is talking about. Right. And so I think that this is what, this is what interesting art does. Right. Is it allows us to see things as if freshly made or it, it undoes, to, uh, it undoes the damage of habituation. Right. And so we're so habituated to these, ideas of love and death and justice and God and the divine and prayer and fear and loneliness, right? We, we're habituated to these things because we spend our lives sitting in them and we spend our lives, you know, afraid of them. Um, and then good art makes them feel new to us, right? Good art makes the desire desiree or good art makes the photosynthesis photosynthesis or the justice justice right? When you read Marilyn Nelson's sonnets for Emmett Till, you know, you're encountering um, a vivid uh, and unforgettable and a searching and a fearless enactment of a particular atrocity that um, undoes the damage of habituation. So when we like sit here on our phones all day, right? And like, it's like a Charmin ad and, you know, baseball scores and then an autoplay snuff film of state murder of an unarmed civilian and then immediately after that, it's like a Hardy's ad or something, you know, um, that's habituation, right? That's like teaching us to scroll past that shit and to like the same way that I don't see the trees, it's teaching us to not see the atrocity, right? But then when we encounter something like Marilyn Nelson's sonnets for Emmett Till, it undoes that damage of habituation. It, it allows us to actually encounter the atrocity made atrocious, right? In the art. And when you actually encounter it, Right. It's like um, it's like Singer's paradox of the of the drowning uh, man or whatever. Like if you see like if, if you were like walking out of a dinner party wearing like a expensive tuxedo and you saw a man drowning in the river, you jump in to save him, even if it ruined your tuxedo. Right. And you'd like bring him out. Um, uh, and that's what's happening all around us every day. Right. Is is we're sort of living in our comfortable tuxedos in our lives, right? And all around the world, there are people drowning. It's just because we can't see them because there's like a, there's a veil between us and them. You know, we're not jumping in the water, you know, we're not throwing our gear, our, our bodies into the gears of this thing. Anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm spinning out, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that, that um, curating a practice of defamiliarization within your life, um, curating, you know, I'm, my spouse is an incredible poet. Um, and, and one of the best, one of my favorite things about being married to them is that when they see a bird, like they really see that bird, you know, like that specific bird, you know, like they'll see like the bit of, they'll see like the bit of white on its one little toe or they'll see, you know, like they, they, when they see like that grasshopper, they see like that specific grass you know what i mean and so like watching them see the world has really been great for me i i, I you know i heartily recommend marrying the poet Paige lewis to everyone you know um it's really it's really done wonders for me and my, uh, yeah <laughs> um okay i think we probably have time for two more questions once yeah, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm like going i'm sorry i'm like yeah hopefully in the I fullness of that, time and so we'll all be able to talk to each other and I think that um, all the questions are kind of getting answered through the conversation. Oh, great. So, yeah. Great. And so I'm going to ask this kind of slightly longer question that has multiple parts and then a very short question at the end. That's great. Okay. So this is the Melissa's asking the longer question. It says, 
Um, it's interesting to see how grief fits into all of this. Two questions. Can you speak more of Clifton's poem and this idea of a second coming of, as an old woman who no man touches, someone who cannot realize that she is old? I am also interested in this depiction of grief and the death of, or the death or dust of woman and how these ideas fit into whatever new world we attempt to embrace in these uncanny times. What is the role of woman here? Are we to debate something or the existence of, say, a fox? Sorry, what was the last? What was the last line? Are we able? To, are, are we to debate something or the existence of, say, a fox? Um, oh, like in the Clifton poem. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And sorry, what was the what was this question asker's name? Melissa. Yeah. Melissa, Melissa, thank you so much for this question. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, again, I'm I'm still very much, you know, uh, sounding my way through all of this, like I think we all are. There's a really, really great, you know, one of the sort of really the anthology um, that exists that most has informed my own um, work as an editor. Um, is Jane Hirschfield, who did that first Enhidwana translation, um, put together a book called Women in Praise of the Sacred. And it was sort of like a corrective to, um, uh, I don't need, well, what, whatever, like Stephen Mitchell's. And, you know, there are, there are a number of translators who have done anthologies of, I, I sort of alluded to earlier, who have done anthologies of spiritual writing that are truly just like, you know, like um, av an avalanche of just like, white, you know, like, and, and listen, I love, I love Blake and Marvell and Dunn and, and, you know, like these are, I like them, but I just don't like them to the exclusion of everyone else, you know? Um, and so Jane Hirschfield did this anthology um, uh, in, I don't know, the early 2000s um, called Women in Praise of the Sacred uh, that I would really, really recommend. It's, it's, it was sort of her corrective. There's another one called Technicians of the Sacred that does a good job of incorporating indigenous texts um, uh, in, including um, the, the Nahuatl poem that I included there. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question exactly, but um, you know, I, uh, yeah, I mean the the questions that you're asking are the questions that I'm asking, and again, I'm I'm one I'm one editor, you know, trying to trying to move through all of this and figure it out and imagine towards it, and um, you know, the texts that have been useful in framing the conversation for me and in sort of illuminating some of this world for me, like the like the Clifton, which I think you mentioned, and um, and I forget which other one, but. Uh, oh, the and uh, Hadona, you know, maybe maybe you know yours will be Mahadevyaka and Patakara, right? Or Teresa of Avila, you know what I mean? Like maybe you'll have other sort of luminaries um, who who do that work for you. You know, sorry, I, I don't know if that answered your question at all. I apologize. Um, this is a it's kind of mad question to end on, but I just think it's kind of curious it. thing to do Great. is. Joe asks, what's the kind of poem you dream of writing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Joe, that's such a good question. Um, I actually dream of writing a lot. And, um, and most of the times I can't remember the language that I've dreamt, but sometimes I do. And I'll like wake up, you know, enough to, you know, scratch it down and then fall back asleep. And then 100,000% of the time, you know, it, I'm always like, God, I'm going to write this down and it's going to unlock everything for me. And it's going to be like, you know, this is such a vision. And it's like, Gabriel came to me with his trumpet in my dream, you know, and then I read it in the morning and it's like, you know, pink banana roller skates or, you know what I mean? Like just some complete gibberish, you know, and it's, and you know, what was, what was earth shattering to me um, uh, in dream is just total nonsense, which is, you know, um, but you know, I mean, the, the, I've never gotten over the idea that, you know, there's some combination of keys that I could press on my computer and like be on the phone with Warren Buffett or, you know what I mean? Like there's like some, there's like some combination of 
you know, like, I don't know, like hacking or making a phone, whatever, but like, there's like some combination of things that I could do on my computer that would like immediately like, and then like, there's some combination of words that I could say, like, I'm an angel from the future and I, and here's your social security number. And here's like this memory that you had as a child. And this is what you named your sled or whatever sort of like Citizen Kane thing, you know, but like, but like, there's some combination of things that I could say that would like convince him to just do whatever I said and then like if I was just like give all your money to like all the you know what I mean and like and I and, and I could just you know and so like I feel like my dream poem or whatever would be like <laughs> would be like whatever that combination of words is that just like like has the sort of like mysterious password that like convinces all of the people with the power in the world to like actually structurally change that you know to like just give up their billions um I know that that's not like a very sort of like <laughs> romantic or pretty answer, but just like purely pragmatically, like there exists, you know, this combination of words, right? Like, like there exists a combination, like, you know, like this is your daughter's middle name or whatever. I don't know. You know, I don't know anything about Warren Buffett actually, but like, you know, like whatever the, whatever the combination of words for like each individual, like oligarch magnate, whatever um, would be to get them to do that, you know? Um, uh that that would be my dream that would be my dream poem you know it's like amazing by, by malaria net forever yeah you know what i mean like just do the shit that you could so fucking easily i'm sorry but you could so easily do and anyways yeah so <laughs> that's my dream poem i know that that's you know I, my second dream poem would be to just write like oh do aggression earn or something like that as if it had never you know like you know the pierre menard uh the argentinian writer jorge luis Borges is one of my favorite writers and he has a story about this writer named Pierre Menard who recreates the Quixote um, from scratch, like not like copying it, but like having like living his life in exactly the same way to be able to reproduce the text that Cervantes made like organically, like every comma and every word in place, like, but just anyways, mine would be like to Pierre Menard, like oh, to aggression earn or, um, you know, I'm no best at Phillips discourse on the logic of language, you, you know, like one of these sort of like monolithic poems of art. Anyways, sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, um, this was really, really lucky. And inshallah, we'll be able to do this again and again in the fullness of time. Inshallah. And um, yeah, I hope you um, work on that poem that's going <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll get cracking. The secret code, if you could just crack it, that would be Yeah, great. I mean, it, it has to exist, right? Like there has to exist like Absolutely. some combination of words that would be like, I'm, you know, the angel of your future. And this is like... Yeah. The, password to your whatever you know what I mean like the, the, like there has to be like enough evidence that eventually he would be convinced that I am who I say I am, you know I'm sure you're gonna figure it out <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe not in this lifetime but eventually <laughs> thank you so so much for your time and for speaking yeah, thank to you us. so much and I'm sorry for all the questions I didn't get to that were yeah there. me too I hope that I hope that all of us will get to break bread and drink good tea at some point in the future definitely in person next time Hopefully. Okay, thank Thanks. you so much. Sponsor Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2021, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.